say Ruth Johnson. It's, or Blackhawk, it's a funnier name. Uh, he's teaching at Stanford, and he has an Iranian exchange student in his class with a smile on his face. Uh, you've figured out by now, you've been in school long enough, that if you, if you preside, provided that the teacher has glasses, that, that he can see you. Uh, if you're smiling, it, it, gets un, it, it undermines the teacher. He wants to know uh, what's so funny. Uh, you can do that, I can name the teachers here with which that would be a very effective <laughs> offense. Uh, uh, so he, he, got, he got the student after class to stay, and he said, what's so funny? Why are you smiling all the time? And the student said, it's this metaphor. Uh, I, I hear it all the time, and we don't, we don't use it in, in my society, in Iran. And so Lakov said, what metaphor? And he said, the solution to my problems. He said, I, and before Lakov could interpose, he said, I never imagined my life uh, as being a volume of liquid bubbling and smoking with some problems precipitating out and others dissolving. Uh, precipitating out for a while and with others dissolving. Partly because of what I do and partly in spite of what I do because there are other catalysts that work on the, on the solution. Well, he was disillusioned to find out from this teacher, Lakoff, that uh, that's not what his fellow classmates were talking about. They were talking about the puzzle metaphor. They're looking for the permanent solution to their problems, the once and for all solution. But Lankoff commented, how, how sane and beautiful is the chemical metaphor, the solution to your problems, because it's a natural occurrence when the problems show up again. And you can never get rid of your problems. Uh, I mean, you're not going to be in heaven unless your problems are there with you. <laughs> uh, he said, but even if you, if you buy the chemical metaphor and you see that it's a beautiful and sane metaphor, uh, better, far better than the one that is in your own culture, but he says, try to change your life. He says, right now, consciously and subconsciously, you're trying to solve 100 problems by the puzzle metaphor. And he said, it's, it's harder, but, and yet this is exactly what Jesus is doing in his parables. He's giving you a better metaphor to live by. He's changing the metaphor, uh, the cultural metaphor that you've interpreted. See, the, 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 the insight that he had is that these, you don't have to think this way, it's cultural. Now what Jesus does is really interesting, it seems to me, with his parables, because they're welcome, but not at first. Uh, if you look at uh, the back of this, well, I'm sorry to be, but I'm sorry, it's on the side. You're sideways now. On the parable? Isaac, would you read the parable for us? Jesus told his disciples this parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out at dawn to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with them for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. Going out about nine o'clock, the landowner saw others standing idle in the marketplace, and he said to them, You too go into my vineyard and I will give you what is just. So they went off. And he went out again around noon and around three o'clock and did likewise. Going out about five o'clock, the landowner found others standing around and said to them, Why do you stand here idle all day? They answered, Because no one has hired us. He said to them, You too go into my vineyard. When it was evening, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Summon the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and ending with the first. When those who had started about five o'clock came, each received the usual daily wage. So when the first came, they thought that they would receive more, but each of them also got the usual wage. And on, re and on receiving, on receiving it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, "These last ones worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us." See, there's that Matthew's. I kid Matthew because I think. It, when you get used to him, when you get on his wave, like you realize that uh, Matthew's got the good news and then he's afraid of it. <laughs> he takes a little back. He gives you $10 and he says, give me $2 back. <laughs> uh, uh, but he, this is only in Matthew's gospel. And look what he said, in making them equal, that's the crux of the problem here. Uh, uh, yeah, you made them equal to us. Uh, go ahead, Isaac, please. I'm sorry to interrupt. These last ones worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us, and bore the day's burden and the heat. He said to one of them in reply, My friend, 
I am not cheating you. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what is yours and go. What if I wish to give this last one the same as you? Or am I not free to do as I wish with my own money? Are you envious because I am generous? Thus the last will be first, and the first will be last. Uh, you'll find it, uh, I was surprised, because there are other parables that seem to be much more of a threat than this one to, to the congregation that you're preaching to, but this is the one that gets the riot. And the reason it drives them crazy is because uh, to pay the, the, the workers who work one hour the same as the others is nonsense. And the reason that's nonsense is because they have the cultural metaphor that time is money. Uh, they want to, even when they want to say, they want to say, well, we're Christians, so we're on Jesus' side on this one. So they interpret the parable to say the last ones must have been so industrious that they that they produced as much in one hour that those who worked all day did. <laughs> They're still trying to salvage the cultural metaphor time is money. But Jesus is giving you another metaphor to live by. Uh, uh, Cardinal George, was he around with, at any time of year? Well, he, he was here for some of you, okay? Um, he was a bad boy, <laughs> but that's why we love him. Uh, he could be a bad boy. Uh, and uh, he told a story when the seminary had their all, uh, time when we started quickly, so it goes back to when I was starting here. This was the gospel. It's the gospel in September in year uh, A, Matthew's year. And uh, he preached on it, and he told a story. It reminded him of a story. That's what stories should do. They remind, remind you of your own story. And he told a story when he was a kid, and his, uh, he used to vacation on his uncle's farm in Michigan. And in fact, he vacationed in, Mich in Michigan until he died. And his sister, too. She moved there. Uh, because they were neighbors, as he, uh, of, of many of us in Chicago. Uh, we knew with their mother. Uh, he, uh, he, he, was, he was a kid on his, uh, it was a summer night. He's sitting on the porch and with his aunt, who's doing something. It's, it's too dark to read the newspaper, maybe, so she's crocheting, but she's not, she's looking at down, she's not looking up. And his uncle goes by in a tractor, and he describes his uncle, this is Cardinal George, <laughs> uh, as uh, being balding, overweight, and slipping from the seat of the tractor. And just as, as, he, as he looks at him, his mother, his, his aunt, without looking up from what she's doing, says, what a fine looking man. And Cardinal George, of course, you know Cardinal, if you know him, you know him. As a kid, he just shrank the adult down. That's what his superior who grew up with him told me, just shrink him down. He used to have a little tablet in his front pocket. And when anybody said anything important, he would take the tablet out and write it down. <laughs> uh, he, he looked at his aunt, and without looking up, she repeated, what a fine-looking man. Now, George is no dummy, even as a kid. He realized he wasn't looking at what his aunt saw. She had been married to him for 40 years, and George was a great romantic. He thought that the Easter story was the beloved disciples knew, and Peter didn't because he looked with the eyes of the all. And so that's what his, grand, his, his aunt was doing. Um, that's what his aunt was doing. So he then, the philosopher, took over, and I lost him because he's, he went into the, George, uh, he said Jesus was changing the terms from productivity to personhood. Okay, I think I know what he was trying to say. But my point is, we, we can only know, we receive, you can only receive something if we already know it. And the thing about the good news is we know it's good news and it's better than what we're, the cultural metaphors we live by, but we fight it at first and then we give in because we know all along that it is good news. I got a call from uh, a woman at, uh, in Glencoe. I was in the South Side for six years and on the North Shore for six years, and believe me, they were totally different experiences. Uh, people who were prejudiced and people who were opinionated. <laughs> uh, the opinionated people don't know they're wrong. <laughs> they don't consider that they could be wrong. Uh, 
But this was a lovely woman, uh, a widow. Uh, the whole time I was there in the parish, Dorothy Beckland, but it's Kay, and I remember her name. Her name's escaped us, 70 year old. Uh, and she called me and said, Father, can I talk to you? And I said, yeah, sure. And she said, um, uh, I'm making up my will. And she had two sons. She said, uh, I just divided it equally between them. And the reason she's telling me this is because one of the sons is a principal at the Catholic school, and he's bought a house in the parish, which is not smart on a Catholic principal's uh, uh, salary. Uh, it might be a nice idea. Uh, and he's got three little kids, and the other son has a guitar, and he's on a train somewhere traveling around the United States and uh, playing his guitar. In other words, they didn't deserve the same, but she treated them equally why? Because she loved them. Uh, Cardinal George wrote a notorious, because he could be a bad boy. Uh, <laughs> oh, George. Uh, uh, he wrote a notorious column in the New World saying that God doesn't love it, us all equally because there are big saints and little saints. And no, I'm not kidding. Well, this parable tells you differently. God makes everybody equal because he has no cheat, because he loves it. He is, if God is love, if that's the metaphorical experience that produces what God's like for us, uh, then he treats them equally. Uh, when, uh, uh, I may have told you this in another context, when uh, Jay McInerney, the novelist, uh, went to, uh, he took a course from Ray Carver, who was the f short story writer, who was very, he was the one to emulate. <coughs> his favorite teacher, and he, um, he got an A, so he went to, he made an appointment to thank Carver for his A, but as he's getting up from his seat, he, he, he knocks over a pile of papers on Carver's desk, and there's a grace of his classmates. They all got A's. <laughs> Not because they deserved it, but because Carver thought of his vocation as one, he was doing it out of love. So uh, it's not because you deserve it. That's not the point. Uh, that's not the point. Uh, just take your A and be happy. Uh, so, so the point is that, that it's a different metaphor to live by than the cultural metaphor time is money. Uh, it offends, it gets you upset when you hear it the first time because it sounds like nonsense. But when you think about it, you think that's a much saner and more beautiful metaphor to live by. And in some ways, you think you've known it all along. Every mother does, every father does. Some teachers do. <laughs> some teachers do. Um, the metaphors to live by.